All right, in this video, we are going to begin exploring the topic of composition of functions. So let's discuss conceptually what composition of functions uh, looks like, and then we'll try an example together. In another video, we'll do more examples. So a composition of functions is kind of like a function within a function. So let's look at a, a practical use of composition. Let's say we begin with a function s of t. And let's say that s of t represents the number of sit-ups a person can do in t minutes. The number of sit-ups that can be done in t minutes. So that's just a regular function, right? We input time, and the output for that function would be the number of sit-ups. But then we've got a second function, which I'll call C of S. Okay, and the S in this function is the same as the S in the function above. So where C of S represents the calories burned, C for calories, uh, as a result of doing S sit-ups. S sit-ups. So now hopefully everybody is super engaged and maybe you're doing some sit-ups while you listen. Feel free or push-ups or whatever your choice is. Um, so now that I have two functions written down, I want to talk again about what would a composition look like in this practical example. So a composition involving these two functions could look like C of S of T, right? And what that means is that you're inputting um, S of T, right? S of T becomes the input, which is the number of sit-ups. And then you're evaluating the C function, which is the number of calories, as a result of doing that many sit-ups. So for example, if I asked you, what is the practical meaning of C of S of three, I'm gonna stick in an actual number just to make this feel a little bit more tangible. So my question for you all is, what does this mean? Because this is a composition of functions. I know it's not really a mathematical example yet, but just conceptually, C of S of three would mean the number of calories burned, right, in doing sit-ups for three minutes. So this three here is representative of time, T in minutes, so three minutes. So we know we are doing sit-ups for three minutes. Um, so we would be able to determine how many sit-ups we did, but then what we care more about is, okay, as a result of doing that many sit-ups, how many calories were burned? So um, let's see, I'll make a little space to write down what we're saying here. So we're saying that the interpretation of this expression here would be the number of calories burned in doing three minutes of sit-ups. Cool, and that would be an example, a practical example of composition of functions. Um, functions are all around us, right? So it's actually really common to have compositions of functions Another just example I'll talk through out loud for half a second would be, let's say we've got a function that talks about the temperature outdoors, right? So, and let's say it's dependent upon the day of the year. In Phoenix, in summer, the temperature is definitely more than the temperature in, let's say, January. Then a, a, an example of a composition could be, maybe we want to determine the cost of cooling the home, right? So the composition of functions there could determine the cost of cooling a home as a function of the day of the year. So if we're, you know, halfway through the year like we are now, it's going to cost more than if we're at the beginning of the year, at least here in Phoenix, right? So that's just a little background about what they are. We use them a lot actually in calculus. Um, so I know some of you will go on and take more math. If this happens to be your last math class, um, just know you always can take more and you can see these ideas getting used. So let's wrap up this video with one example 
uh, of just walking through given an actual function uh, f and g. Let's say we begin with the function f of x is equal to x plus 2 and a function g which is equal to, let's pick on a quadratic, x squared minus 3. So we've just got these two separate functions minding their own business. f of x is a linear function. We could graph it. We know what it looks like. g of x is a quadratic. And we're going to try composing these functions. Now, there's actually two different orders in which we can compose them. So we're going to find two things. I'll start by writing out the two things we're going to find. And then we'll find them. So let's find f of g of x and g of f of x. So we can find two different compositions because I can change up the order. The other thing I should bring up at this point is there are really two notations for compositions. You can see how I'm writing them here. I kind of like this notation. It feels a little bit more intuitive or instructive to me personally. But a lot of times in textbooks, you'll see f of g written out as f with this nice little open circle. So it's different than a times ing symbol. f of g of x is another way to write that. Um, g of f of x, we could write g of f of x. So the notation that I wrote on the left there, right, these two here, these are both saying the same thing. So you can pick which one you prefer. Similarly, at the end here with our g of f of x, these are saying the same thing. So take your pick. Um, I tend to just use that top form. I, I think it's, it's useful, it's helpful. But in case you've ever heard people talking about fog and goff, right? That sounds a little strange. That's just a reference to the second notation. So people call f of g fog because they take that little open circle as like an O, so that's fog. And then down here, people call this one goth. So for what it's worth, that may, may be more than you were interested in about notation, but in math, there tend to be more than one notation for, often, for several different things. So take your pick. So I'm just gonna back it up to that first notation and let's talk through Calculating this, so let's find f of g of x. This literally means, in terms of a function machine, that the input of the function is g of x and the output is f. So to draw this out a little bit more carefully, a function machine for f of g of x says input g of x. I'm gonna draw these a little bigger. And then the output becomes f of g of x. So what I see a lot of folks do with composition is they'll, they'll keep the f out front for a moment, but then g of x is a function we know. It's just equal to x squared minus 3. So when I see g of x, I'm going to swap it out with its definition. g of x is x squared minus 3. Coming back to my function notation, then I need to now say, what is f of x squared minus 3? So this means I need to evaluate function f at an input of x squared minus 3. So anytime I see an x in function f, I replace it with x squared minus 3. So I'm going to write it out this way and then kind of pause and see how we feel about that. Function f, just as a friendly reminder, is x plus 2. So it's basically saying take your input and add 2 to it. And that's exactly what we did at this last line. We took our input, which happened to be x squared minus 3, and then we added 2 onto that. If we want to simplify to wrap it up, we sure can. Uh, in this case, as you can tell, that just looks like combining like terms. So I'm going to wrap this example up by saying f of g of x is equal to x squared minus 1 when I combine my like terms. So that may not make perfect sense yet, which is why if you're able just to kind of hang tight through a couple more examples, I think it will become a bit more clear. Um, I know plenty of folks that like to jump right from my first line to my last line. 
and that's definitely something you can do. I just went ahead and tried that intermediate line in case it's of any value for folks out there. So let's try the opposite direction. Let's try g of f of x then. So g of f of x says take g and evaluate it at f. Well, function f, we already know the equation for f is f is equal to x plus 2. So that becomes the input for g. And what that means is now anytime I see an input of x in function g, I'll just be replacing it with x plus 2. So function g says, take your input. My input is x plus 2. Then it tells me to square the input, right? That's what x squared means, the input squared. And then don't forget to subtract 3. So I don't think I'm going to do any further cleanup there. I'm not going to bother foiling out x plus 2. So let's leave g of f of x as x plus 2, oops, sorry, x plus 2 squared minus 3. And that would be g of f of x. So kind of interesting idea. Let's do some more in the next video, but hopefully that gives us a good start.